we go over to the last speaker of today's uh, competition, uh, Mr. Um, Jabbar from, um, yeah, formerly, the, or no, he's still in the open, but now he's in the United States, as we have learned during the organization. So thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to my talk. So today I'm going to be speaking about uh, contact damage uh, resistance of ceramics, and I will show you how we can improve that on the example of layered alumina. So if you think about ceramics in advanced structural applications, you will find that in most cases, our ceramic parts will be subjected to contact loading. Here I'm showing you some examples, such as ceramic cutting tools or ceramic bearings as used in wheel bearings or in hip joint implants. So why is it important to study contact damage? Well, that's because of its prevalence as more than one third of ceramic failure cases were found to be related to contact damage. So typically contact damage takes the form of Hertzian contact cracking, which appears on the surface as a ring crack and extends to the subsurface as a cone crack. So what are the strategies that we can use to enhance contact damage resistance of ceramics? One of the strategies that is being used in the literature is to tailor the microstructure in order to shift the damage from uh, Hertzian macroscopic cone cracking to a distributed subsurface micro cracking. This can be done by introducing weak interfaces into the microstructure or increasing the grain size or the amount of porosity. So this strategy can indeed enhance contact damage tolerance. However, this comes at the cost of wear resistance. Another strategy is to use compressive residual stresses to shield the cracks. And this strategy has been commercially realized under the name Gorilla Glass for the production of scratch resistant, uh, resistant glass, which can be used in electronic devices. So on the other hand, there has been also a lot of work on trying to improve damage tolerance of ceramics in general by building multi-materials uh, while using also compressive residual stresses, either at the surface to achieve mechanical resistance, as we know from Gorilla Glass, or embedded in the structure in the internal layers to achieve damage tolerance. And in this work, we followed the damage tolerance approach. So here the material can tolerate the presence of surface defects by arresting crack propagation at the internal layers. And this has been shown in previous works on the example of thermal shock tests. So my hypothesis was that this could also be very effective against the propagation of surface contact damage. On the top of that, there has been also extensive research on not only using compressive residual stresses, but also on tailoring the microstructure by uh, taking inspiration from uh, the mollusk shell. And here, such hierarchical architectures can be replicated by microstructural texturing. And this has been proven to be very effective against the propagation of, uh, of uh, surface cracks. So in our materials, we used both strategies. On the one hand, by an appropriate design of the layer's thicknesses, we managed to induce compressive residual stresses of 250 megapascal. And also in addition to that, we textured the microstructure. So our basic idea was that to enhance contact damage tolerance using internal uh, protective layers that are both textured and hold compressive residual stresses. So the main aims of my thesis was to answer two main questions. One, what will be the effect of texturing on the nature of contact damage? And two, whether this layered alumina design can actually lead to uh, contact damage tolerance. So let's start with the materials of study. Our first material will be equiaxed alumina, which represents a conventional polycrystalline ceramic. Then we have textured alumina, and with this material, we can investigate the effect of texturing on the material's response. And finally, we have our layered alumina design, which is a combination of both materials with, with the residual stresses. For the methodology, we chose spherical indentation as it gives us a close representation of uh, contact loading scenarios that can be expected in real life applications. We also equipped our test setup with acoustic emission sensors in order to monitor the materials response during testing. Then we evaluated the acoustic emission sensors according, according to their energy. And the final results were uh, represented in a diagram showing acoustic emission energy as function of indentation load. So let's start with the first results from Equiax alumina. So here you can see a representative diagram taken from one of the measurements. 
So if we increase the load, we detect the first signal at about 800 Newton. And if we look at the surface of the sample, we see that this signal corresponds to the formation of a Hertzian ring crack. So now if we further increase the load, we detect also high energy signals. And these were found to be related to the formation of full ring crack and its extension into a cone crack, as can be seen here from the cross-sectional view. So this is a classical behavior that we know from ceramics, but what we learned from equiaxed alumina is that uh, events of Hertzian ring and cone cracking are sources of high energy signals. So now let's see what will be the effect of texturing. So in textured alumina, the damage starts by emitting low energy signals. And if we look at the surface, we don't see any signs of damage. This suggests that the damage started in the subsurface. Now, if we further increase the load, we see a different damage pattern on the surface where the damage is distributed along the contact area in the form of surface depression. Now, if we look at the subsurface in the cross section, we can see that there are some traces of damage. Now, let's take a closer look at the damage mechanisms. Here, you can see the surface of a sample loaded at 1500 Newton. If you look at the 3D confocal uh, image, we can clearly see the surface depression. And this is very interesting as it looks similar to indentation damage that we know from uh, ductile materials such as metals. This means texturing gives us some sort of quasi plasticity. Now, if we look at the subsurface, we see again some traces of damage, but because of the act of grinding and polishing, we only see some grain pullouts. So in order to see what, what is exactly happening, we use the ion slicing technique. And as you can see, there are multiple cracks oriented horizontally along the grain boundaries of textured grains. This indicates that the damage occurred in response to shear stresses by some sort of an interfacial shear sliding mechanism. For comparison, uh, here is an image of an ion sliced pristine sample where we don't see any cracks. So now let's see how our layered alumina design will behave. So similar to textured alumina, the damage starts by emitting low energy signals. And if we look at the surface, we don't see any damage, which means that the damage started in the internal textured layer. So if we further increase the load, we detect a high energy signal. And this signal was found to be related to the formation of ring at cone crack, as we observed earlier in uh, equiaxed alumina. So in our layered alumina design, we have both types of damage modes, starting by uh, subsurface shear faulting in the internal textured layer, and then followed by Hertzian ring at concrete formation in the surface layer. So now let's see what happens beyond the ring crack initiation force. This means at even higher forces. And here's a cross-sectional view of a sample loaded at 1500 Newton. In the normal light image, you can see this, uh, sub, uh, the subsurface damage in the internal textured layer. If we look at the polarized light image, we can see the deflection of the cone crack at the internal textured layer. Now let's increase the load to even higher force. And we can see that the subsurface damage intensifies. But what's interesting here is that the cone crack remains limited in depth. This means that further damage was then only absorbed by the internal textured layer. Now let's see the, let's look at the interface using the ion slicing technique. And we can see the deflection of the cone crack at the internal textured layer along the textured grains. And if we look at the internal textured layer, we can see again the subsurface shear faulting as we saw earlier in textured alumina, which appears in the form of micro cracking along the grain boundaries. So what have we achieved so far by the layered design? If we compare layered alumina to equiaxed alumina, we will see that in equiaxed alumina, while indenting at the same load, we will see that in equiaxed alumina, the cone crack extends under loading without any hindrance. Meanwhile, in layered alumina, the cone crack is deflected at the internal textured layer and remains limited in depth. So at this point, I can answer my two main questions. For the effect of texturing, we saw that texturing changes the damage behavior from classical Hertzian concentrated cone cracking to a distributed subsurface shear faulting or micro cracking. And this gives us some damage tolerance as we get some sort of quasi plasticity. For our layered alumina design, we saw how effective it is uh, in that it shows uh, its ability in, defle in deflecting propagating cone cracks and thereby limiting their depth regardless of the applied load. So for, we learned a lot on how effective this could be. 
So, and now for future work, we will look at the effect of the surface layer thickness. And from preliminary results, we saw that it is possible to uh, control the damage mode by designing the outer layer thickness with respect to the shear stress field. For example, if we increase the, uh, the surface layer thickness, we can avoid the formation of subsurface shear faulting. So I believe that these results will have important implications if we think about novel applications where we could use such layered designs for the production of hip joint implants, which can be very damage tolerant. So thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in this work, you can read more about it in our recently published paper in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society. Thank you. Thank you as well for your nice talk, Mr. Jawa. <clears throat> um, are there any questions? Frank? Yes. Frank, do you want to go first? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering how you produce stress-free uh, materials by having an aluminum um, grain orientation on a material which was um, random distributed aluminum oxide. You mean in the layered aluminum design? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is not easy, isn't it? Yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, to reduce residual stresses, we combined two materials, with, which is equioxed alumina and textured alumina in a layered design. And these were both uh, co-centered together at high temperature. And during cooling down, our equioxed alumina has a higher thermal expansion. This means it will shrink more than our textured alumina. And, but uh, these both materials are strongly bonded. So at, the, at room temperature, our equioxed alumina will have uh, tensile residual stresses and our textured alumina will have compressive residual stresses. But if we design the layer thicknesses, we can achieve high compressive residual stresses and uh, small residual, uh, tensile residual stresses. So it's about combining two materials with different uh, thermal uh, physical properties. And those stresses use, oh yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Sorry, Frank. Um, Angelica. Yeah, well, I had the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that I overlooked you. Um, okay, um, further questions from the audience? Um, so, I have a question. So you're saying that the um, surface has a higher um, thermal expansion than the body in the middle. So you yeah. don't see any delamination? No, because uh, both layers are strongly bonded. And we saw that in SEM, they are, you have a really strong interface. And this is what gives rise to our residual stresses. Mm -hmm. see there are no delaminations, and this is the interface between equioxed alumina and our textured alumina material. Mm -hmm. And how you ensure this strong interface? Uh, by uh, co-centering the materials together, uh, mm -hmm. which are were which were produced by tape casting. So we have okay. tape cast layers that were pressed together and co-centered. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor Hoffman. Yeah, exact to that problem. Uh, did you measure these stresses? Uh, we didn't measure these stresses, but uh, these can be analytically estimated using this formula. Yeah, but so, you can also experimentally measure it. Uh, we By didn't... Raman spectroscopy, for example. So you get yeah, the stresses but... in the surface near region. Yeah, we didn't look at that, but we saw the... Uh, the magnitude of the, the residual stresses in our indentation experiments. So we did some Bible analysis on the ring crack initiation force. And thanks to our test setup, we can see at which force the ring crack initiates as we calculated the stresses. And from that, we saw that uh, there's some difference between layered alumina and equioxed alumina. 
and the difference was about 70 megapascal, which is in the same order of magnitude of our tensile residual stresses that, can, that are analytically estimated. But we okay. didn't look uh, at uh, exactly measuring the residual stresses. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Frank, one quick question. Very quick question. What happens if you change the outer layer, which you give with 100 micrometers to a higher thickness? Yeah, uh, this will be done in future work, but we have some preliminary results. So we increased the outer layer thickness because subsurface shear folding occurs by the, uh, in response to the shear stresses below the surface. So we thought that if we increase the outer layer thickness, uh, so that the shear stress remains uh, within the surface layer. Uh, and we saw in our uh, acoustic emission diagrams that uh, we can avoid the formation of subsurface shear faulting. So we have a classical behavior that we know from ep alumina. And this is not always an advantage because the subsurface shear faulting is beneficial for damage absorption. But this could be beneficial if we look at wear resistance, uh, like in cyclic fatigue. So we can avoid the subsurface shear faulting. So maybe this material will behave better under cyclic fatigue because we don't have subsurface shear faulting. Okay, one quick question. So thank you um, because I have overlooked the in the chat um, before. So this time I'm not overlooking this uh, question. If you would change the order of your material from ELE to LEL, would this have any significant effect? Yeah, sure. Uh, if we change the order, we will change our uh, our idea to a surface layer design where we have the compressive residual stresses on the surface. This is also good, but uh, here, if we initiate uh, contact cracks, then our material will fail because we don't have any uh, protective layers. Mm -hmm. So this design is used for uh, Gorilla Glass that we know. Here we want to avoid the crack formation, but in our design, we say, yeah, it's okay to form cracks, but we want to arrest these cracks. Mm -hmm. So it's diff two different approaches, it depends on the application, but we want to tolerate contact damage. Okay, thank you. So thank you again, oh, and uh, all the participants uh, for these, um, for their nice talks and um, a lot of work has been was done in your um, yeah, um, thesis, in your bachelor's or master's thesis. And um, I would like to remind you again that afterwards there's a presentation on um, the JAX um, Young Ceramists Network, and um, which is right after this talk or this competition. So thank you again, everyone. And um, the jury will now uh, convene and uh, we will uh, discuss the results or the ranking of the participants. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.